Okay, good evening. Here is my Module 3 uh, tool for understanding Syria in four hours. I became interested in investigating a little bit more about Syria based on experiences I had in Jordan a couple years ago where I was working in uh, Syrian refugee camps uh, kind of before we started hearing more uh, specifically about it in the news. Um, there were some camps in Jordan um, in areas where refugees were living in Jordan, so it just kind of piqued my interest in the issue and kind of showed me the complexity and diversity of personal experiences of the Syrian refugees. I'm also really interested in investigating more about Article 14 of the UN Declaration of Human Rights about kind of refugee rights and the right to migration and movement. So I thought Syria would be a good place to do that. While the right exists in the ideal sense within the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, so while it technically is a universal human right, uh, I'm interested in investigating a little bit more in practice how people view that right across the world uh, and whether they believe uh, in practice it's an absolute right or something kind of a little differently. And we're seeing a lot of interesting stuff with that currently now in the news. Uh, I'm going to try and kind of race through these slides, so I'm going to speak a little fast because um, I know it's um, hard to sit and listen to stuff. So, um, let's see. Okay, first slide. So, historical background. It all goes back to, um, goes back way far. Uh, we're looking at pre-World War I Ottoman Empire. Uh, Syria was formerly a part of the um, Ottoman Empire. Um, under Sykes-Pico, it's going to be broken up under you know, spheres of influence, spheres of control, kind of colonialism, and Syria is going to be under French influence. Um, they will leave in around 46, and then Syria eventually is going to start to, to become under the influence of the Soviet Union starting in the late 1950s. Uh, so Syria was Ottoman, and then it was French, and then it was a part of the Soviet Union. It's kind of being uh, that you don't see a lot of independent um, Syria historically, a lot of outside influences getting their hands involved in Syrian politics. Um, more specific stuff, uh, historical background about um, Syria related to the current uh, refugee crisis. Uh, two sources I, I look to, uh, the Green brothers, Hank Green and John Green. They're great for trying to understand historical issues in five minutes or less. I also found a BBC news resource that had kind of eight steps or eight stages um, to understand the Syrian civil war. So these are three great resources I would recommend. A couple things that they highlight is under Soviet uh, influence, the rise of the Ba'ath Party, which was an Alawite minority. Um, this is how the Assad family uh, came into power. It was kind of through Soviet influence. The majority of the Syrian population are Sunni Muslims, uh, while the Alawite is a Shia minority. Uh, so under uh, the Soviet Union, this minority uh, received more of the power, unfair privileges, kind of two-tier law systems were set up. So there was this great disparity and system of privileges that definitely fostered social unrest and social tension for 50 plus years. Uh, violent uprisings started to happen in Syria in March of 2011, and this is under kind of the greater influence of the Arab Spring. Uh, some individuals in Syria were influenced by what they were seeing happening across the Arab world and started um, pro-democracy protests. Uh, these pro-democracy protests in Syria were violently suppressed by the Assad regime. Um, this leads to, in turn, the protests spreading even further. Um, by July of 2011, uh, thousands of people are across Syria were protesting. So something that kind of started as a small uh, protest really rapidly in, gets bigger given the Assad regi regime's uh, really strong reaction to it. Um, over time, these protest groups uh, become armed, um, and it involves more into a sectarian conflict, a lot of sectarian violence, and it involves into a full-on civil war. Uh, and this is a really interesting resource from Visions of Humanity. 
kind of showing um, some different stats that they look at in Syria from 2010 to 2015. So you can really see kind of the rise as the uh, as the violence in Syria escalates. So kind of before the civil war, before the Arab Spring, then we have just kind of the outbreak of the Arab Spring. And then as Syria kind of descends into its initial civil war, a quick uptake in all of these um, dangerous factors making kind of Syria is a really, really dangerous place to live. And then it just kind of fully escalate, escalating into the most dangerous place to currently live in terms of militarization, security, um, and high amounts of domestic and internal conflict. Um, so you can kind of see this snapshot um, from 2010 to 2015 as the, these things are starting to emerge. So as all these different groups, um, so the Assad regime is armed, which is the government, the um, and also these different groups protesting the Assad regimes. As these protest groups become armed, Syria um, falls into a civil war uh, with both sides committing some pretty horrible war crimes, murders, torture, rape, uh, enforced disappearances, and civilian suffering, uh, such as blocking access to food, water, and health services. And this information comes from Amnesty International. Um, it was interesting. I came across um, a thing on, Am on the Amnesty International website, a strongly worded letter to Assad asking him to give permission for international observers to inspect prison, prisons and detention centers to look for um, some of these individuals who have disappeared in detention, um, asking Assad to kind of enforce UN Resolution 2139 uh, from the Security Council. And this reminded me a lot of the UN Me movie, this idea of kind of, you know, what are you going to do about it? Well, we're going to send a strongly worded letter, um, kind of thinking about that a conflict were started to explore between ideals and practice and the ability of the UN to actually do anything about human rights abuses. Um, on the next slide, I want to highlight um, when I was investigating, I was really interested in finding out some of the historical, political, and economic things that influenced uh, the rise of the Soviet, uh, Syrian civil war, but I was also interested in the things that uh, turning points or tipping points that made the world aware of the Syrian conflict um, and some kind of specific events that kind of made uh, made it news or made it uh, moved the Syrian conflict into the international consciousness. Um, and one of these things was uh, in August of 2013, uh, some issues that arose around the use of chemical weapons in Syria. Um, and this is where the U.S. Uh, the U.S. was involved before, but they continue. Uh, they started to really get publicly involved. Uh, when Obama had drawn a line about use of chemical weapons, uh, as reports started leaking out that chemical weapons were being used by were being used by the Assad regime, uh, kind of Kerry comes out with this kind of initially seemingly uh, ridiculous diplomatic statement about, well, if Assad agrees to turn him over, the U.S. won't get involved. Assad, says, with Russia's kind of support, says yes, you know, please come in, uh, send in a dipl um, diplomatic team, a joint mission led by the UN and the OPCW to come in and take away all the chemical weapons. Uh, so it seemed at the time to be a diplomatic solution. Um, the weapons were removed a year later, but reports still, um, there's still reports that um, chemical weapons are being used in the civil war in Syria. Um, let's see. This really put, but this whole issue around um, chemical weapons being used in the civil war kind of puts it more onto a global sphere, the Syrian conflict. Uh, as the conflict continues to emerge, um, things have gotten more and more uh, complicated. I thought this was a great infographic. Well, we have the Syrian government, uh, which is Assad, who are fighting the rebels, these pro-democracy forces. Um, each of these two gro groups are then supported by other individuals. Uh, so Syria, Syria being uh, backed by Russia, Iran, and Hezbollah. The U.S. being a larger U.S. coalition being backed by Turkey and the Gulf states. Um, so it's a kind of like who's actually fighting who and why and how. But then also looking at the sectarian issue, um, Shiite and Sunni conflicts. Oops. Um, 
in that uh, the reason uh, Assad is being supported by Iran um, and Hezbollah connects with Shiite alliances and Sunni alliances, the rebels and the Gulf states, but then there's this emerging kind of third group within this of uh, extremists, um, the Islamic State or self-proclaimed Islamic State. Um, so it's becoming, uh, you know, there are multiple factions of people involved both internally and externally in the conflict as it continues to evolve um, into a very complicated civil matter, but also a very complicated uh, international matter as it's kind of a proxy war for the U.S. and Russia, proxy war, um, rising influence of ISIS, um, latest incidents in Paris, um, things continue to evolve. Um, here's another uh, graphic kind of looking at all the different kind of influences and presences within Syria. Um, so this has overarchingly another kind of point where Syria has made it in the news internationally. All of this has developed into a very large humanitarian crisis. Um, the people leaving Syria for the most part are not migrants, they are refugees. Um, and I think it's of note to kind of define and look at the different uh, types of people uh, or the definitions of these different groups of people. Uh, so a refugee is a person who has fled his or her own country and cannot return due to fear of persecution and um, has been given refugee status. Uh, refugee status is given to applicants by the United Nations or a third party country. In comparison, a migrant is someone who voluntarily chooses to leave his or her own country and make a new life in another country. Uh, given what's going on in Syria, I think you'd be hard pressed to argue that people who are fleeing have a choice. Um, I've got some numbers later of the number of refugees and internally d displaced people in Syria. Um, so an asylum seeker is a person who has fled from his or her own country due to fear of persecution and has, and has applied for legal and physical protection in another country, but has not yet had their claim for protection assessed. Um, a person remains an asylum seeker until their protection status has been determined. Uh, an internally displaced person is someone who is living inside the borders of their own country, but is unable to safely, li safely live in their home, own home or region. Um, and all of this information comes uh, from a website uh, called Roads to Refuge. Um, there's also some information on stateless persons. Uh, I'm not going to go into that now for the safe, sake of time. Uh, so here you go, uh, a couple more statistics. Um, I pulled this one because it shows um, more information. It breaks it down into this refugees, asylum seekers, IDPs, and stateless individuals. Um, and some interesting statistics. Um, Here are kind of, we're talking about a little over 4 million people at this time, mostly women and children. Uh, there are men, but most of the men are staying to fight or have been killed in uh, the fighting already. So it's mostly women and children fleeing, uh, even though it looks like half and half. Uh, I think these are mostly, you know, very young individuals. Uh, again, change over time graph really the humanitarian crisis starts to really escalate in 2013, use of chemical weapons, the rise of violence within the Civil War. Uh, looking at who is really receiving these refugees, I think, uh, as we've all seen in the news, a lot of it attention has been played to Europe and the, what's ha the impact of Syria and Europe, but really the majority of refugees are, be ta are being taken in by Turkey, Lebanon, Egypt, Jordan, um, and some in Iraq, and there's also interest in the Iraqi refugees going to Syria and Syrian refugees going into Iraq. Uh, Jordan, also pr proportion of population, Jordan is taking on massive numbers of refugees. Uh, Jordan is a much smaller country, so yes, well, there are two, over 2 million Syrian refugees in Turkey. Um, it doesn't quite mean the same thing as a little over a half million in Jordan, just given the percentage uh, another infographic graphic kind of showing uh, who's taking in the Syrian refugees. Uh, important to note, uh, this does not include the Gulf states. <laughs> uh, it's really interesting, the conversations I've had with people in Palestine and Jordan talking about the role of Saudi Arabia and all of this, 
and they have a lot of uh, choice words uh, for the role of the Gulf states in refugee crises and humanitarian aid. Um, again, more graphics kind of visually showing who's taking in the refugees. This is Europe's number. Showing kind of where the refugees are going in, or asylum seekers are going in Europe. Also kind of talking about, uh, thinking about this issue from a people and personal standpoint versus just a statistics standpoint, another turning point in the global reporting on the Syrian refugee crisis is this image uh, that started to float around news outlets in September. So kind of point turning points in media coverage I think is also interesting. Uh, important uh, legal frameworks in regards to this issue is the 1951 convention relating to the status of refugees and then the 1967 uh, optional protocol relating to the state of status of refugees. And these establish the definition of a refugee as well as the principle of non refoulement You can't return people or send them back and the rights afforded to those uh, granted refugee status. Um, let's see. Um, this was initially, the 1951 convention was a response drafted in response to the many thousands of displaced people in Europe after the Second World War. Um, this can, it, again, it defines who is a refugee, anyone outside their own country who has a well-founded fear of being persecuted due to his race, religion, his or her race, religion, nationality, member of a particular social group or political opinion, and is unable or unwilling to return. We also have Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 14, the basic rights and fundamental freedoms for all human beings are recognized in every country. Uh, rights are inalienable and equally applicable to everyone. Um, every one of us is born free and has equal dignity and rights. Uh, 14 supports the right of all people to be able to seek asylum from persecution. Um, some interesting kind of small things or smaller stories that I came across are really great, again, BBC resources. Uh, looking at the things people are carrying. Uh, I think this is a great resource to use with students. Uh, the BBC has a collection of kind of primary sources of what, what Syrian refugees are bringing with them. Uh, interestingly enough, a lot of these tie back to someone, a gift or small thing that someone had been given and that that person has now died. They, that person had to remain in Syria and you know everyone who gave them that thing has now died or passed away, so the danger is real and imminent. Uh, also came across this really interesting story about a, I believe it was a Dutch teenager who has is actually like the four on the forefront of mapping all of this through all these really interesting social media connections. So kind of an interesting uh, connection for students as well. Kind of the impact a teenager is having on a seemingly incredibly remote seems like it's not connected to him, uh, but he's involved. Uh, also kind of looking to some of the solutions. Uh, and things that have been going on with this kind of push to collect baby carriers and then an interesting post talking about uh, why this is kind of a really, really silly idea. Uh, I remember from discussions with people in Jordan getting ready for winter and the impact of winter on refugees and some of the small things that are uh, the UN is currently doing. Uh, just something that's coming up that should be uh, taken into perspective. Uh, some of the UN sources also talk about uh, it's really important to consider currently the lack of in infrastructure to deliver any sort of aid in Syria, and so that's something that should be kept in mind when looking to solutions. Uh, I started my bibliography, but I looked at um, kind of so many different sources, as you see throughout, that getting them in MLA format uh, was unrealistic at this point, hopefully by the end. Uh, so I started working on it, but I've got, you know, over 10 sources and getting all of that stuff done uh, was taking lots of time. Okay, bye.